One more. Alex writes, I've got one more. I'll give you time, time to find something really good. Um, I'm going to try to uh, uh, condense this somewhat. Um, I know that you were on creative teams, but if you were not in creative at a promotion, how much sway would a manager have backstage? Were you treated like another wrestling talent, or would they come to you as if you were in charge of the midnight or a specific wrestler you were managing? Uh, I've also heard you tell stories of talents just saying no to certain matches promotions wanted them to have or people they wanted them to drop a title to. My second question is, if a talent says no to something, does it normally end right there? Is that only if you're a top talent? Were any wrestlers you know of ever forced into matches that they had said no to, either by the promotion just telling them, no, you're going to fucking do it, or using some legal excuse like contractual obligations? If this did occur, do you know of any examples where it turned into a shoot because it was forced? <laughs> Besides the obvious Montreal screw job, yeah. Uh, fucking, yeah. <laughs> no, first question. Um, in a lot of cases, especially at TV, um, it, obviously in, in Mid South in Louisiana, we did what Bill Dundee told us to do because I was definitely learning, and and Bobby did us. We were all glad to have the spot. And, of course, then there was still a lot of leeway left. And on promos, you know, Dundee or even Watts would give you the bullet points and things, lines he might specifically want you to say, but the delivery was up to you. So we had a lot of a lot of freedom in that respect, more than, than you know, they have these days. In, in Dallas, they started coming to me somewhat uh, as the manager on, you know, obviously, well, and always booking sheets and checks and, the paperwork and documents that from the very start. Cause I always kept up with that for the midnight. Uh, then they started coming to me for some ideas in Dallas. And then when we went to work for Crockett, you know, obviously we were going to follow dusty through hell with gasoline britches on and any, you know, JJ, any of his representatives or whatever. But after a while, even in, and I wasn't as assertive as I am now back then, but when they got, the idea that, okay, here's what Cornette does for these guys. I got all the plane tickets. I got all the booking sheets. I got all the official documents. I got all the paychecks. It, the, anything that was given out by the office, I was the guy to go to for the Midnight Express. Also, especially on television, especially at the TBS tapings, basically JJ would just uh, say, you know, okay, you've got Vernon Deaton and, and you know, uh, uh, David Isley. Uh, you got five minutes, set it up. And, and I would, because I took time to, to pay attention to the, to the guys who were doing jobs on TV and, and we knew them and we knew who they were. We knew what they could do and what they couldn't do. And then I was the move inventor for the midnight and the move namer. So I, if I would come up with something that Bobby and Dennis or later on Bobby and Stan, we needed to try out. You never got in a ring those days unless you were in front of people. So we tried shit out on TBS against the job guys, <laughs> which is when you look back at it, uh, national TV is not a great time to try shit out, but that was the time we had. So a lot of the Midnight Express finishes that you see from those days were done first on Atlanta TV, just to see how it worked. And I would get with the guys and tell them how to take it because we would have worked that out in our heads ahead of time. So nobody got hurt. And then, you know, after a while, then I got more input on the, the matches and the house show matches. We'd still, we'd get a finish so-and-so over and I might suggest something or we'd get a finish and they'd say, do what you did in Philadelphia. And I'd have that in my book because I'd written it down. So that way, when we were in Austin, Texas and somebody said, do what you did in Philadelphia, I'd be the one that would remember it. So yes, there was a, a level of, uh, you know, treating them, uh, treating us, uh, treating me like a manager of the team in that respect. Um, but it, guys had sway back then, depending on their spot on the card. If we had done a lot of it, we could have probably gotten away with saying, no, we don't want to do that. We want to change, do something else. But a lot of times we just made what they wanted, something that we liked too, and did it. Um, it wasn't until TBS took over that we really started butting heads with, with any office anywhere we ever worked. Um, 
As far as talent saying no to certain matches or to drop a championship or whatever, I've said before, I, it seemed to me to be around the mid-90s when the Booker's instructions became the Booker's suggestions. And I, I still am not used to that. But all talents have always had the ability, to, in some respect, to say no. Whether it's, no, fuck it, I've had enough, I'm just, here's my notice, I'm fucking done, or I'm walking out, or whatever. Or, no, I don't want to do it this way, I want to do it the way I want to do it. Uh, Ernie Ladd was a master of that. But the top guys had to protect their reputations, and they didn't want to just do jobs willy-nilly to everybody in every territory. Um, they always wanted input in how they were portrayed, and and uh, to some extent, the success or failure they had in the ring because it all related to business. And in those days, they were getting paid based on the gates. So even if if a top star felt that the booker wanted him to do something like in, in the destroyer bio in the observer recently, uh, they wanted him to take his mask off at first. He didn't want to wear the mask, but when he saw it getting over, then he didn't want to take it off and they wanted to take the mask off. And he said, fucking no, and didn't. And he ended up being a legend and making, you know, tons of money with that mask. So if you were a top star figured into a territory, you had a lot of leeway as long as you didn't just become a you know real bitter pill to fucking deal with sometimes you could avoid doing a job or do it a different way or sometimes you could change certain matches to benefit yourself but then the booker also had to worry about the other guy cuz the other guy may have been as important to him as the guy that was complaining underneath guys just need to do what the fuck you tell them to do because they ought to be happy to be there cuz anybody else could be guys in the middle if it's something ridiculous you know, then that's on a case by case basis. Um, Ole didn't like it that time. I told him they weren't going to put a pumpkin over my fucking head, but he didn't fire me just because I wouldn't take a fucking pumpkin over the head. And then we ended up walking out three days later. So it saved him the trouble. But um, just because you don't want to do every single thing doesn't mean you were always going to get fired because half the time bookers in those days realized that they were in charge of a bunch of fucking you know, outlaw wrestlers and they were going to have headaches from time to time. So they just tried to have a good batting average with getting most of the stuff they wanted done. But would only it, have fired you if it had been his idea instead of Jim Hurd's idea? Um, I, no, I, th- I think that was probably Oli's idea. Oh, I, th- well, I, th- I think it was probably Oli's idea just because he was trying to they, look. None of this was Oli's idea and that he was doing a wrestling pay-per-view where the announcers were dressed like fucking gangsters from the thirties and <laughs> You know, and everybody was dressing up in fucking costumes and this bullshit. So I'm sure right there already we've crossed Ole's fucking uh, uh, comfort zone. But he, knowing that the office wanted a bunch of Halloween shit and there's fucking pumpkins everywhere, well, they could hit you over that with a pumpkin. You run around with a jack o' lantern on your head. No, I won't, Ole, because we're already doing a job in the fucking first match to a makeshift team. And then the fucking guys that we're working a program with, I'm causing to get beat against the Freebirds. And so now that we've both fucking lost in the first three fucking matches, then you're going to have them take all the heat back off me with the pumpkin. I ain't putting the pumpkin on my fucking head. They should have done it with Heyman. He had so much makeup on his face was orange anyway. (laughs) Paul Lee would run to the makeup chair whenever they started bringing. (laughs) No, seriously, he looked forward to it. They started doing makeup at the TBS TVs when Turner bought the company. And then they've got a goddamn makeup play for nobody used makeup on wrestling TV announcers, wrestlers, whoever, just the girls back then. And there weren't that many of them. And I always thought it was ridiculous, but because I think Paul saw it as, as it's, well, this is like real TV and I, we've got a makeup person and I'm really a host of a show or whatever the fuck. And I was like, I don't want to this day. I don't wear makeup. I don't want that greasy powdery shitty shit on my face. It makes me uncomfortable. This is what I look like for good and bad. There's a few blotches, not as bad as it could be, but I ain't fucking putting that shit in the WWF they would make me get in that chair and I would say, just give me a little powder. And then I'd go wipe off as much as I could before it got on my fucking shirt. Just horrible. Hate it. Hate it. Who was the worst offender in the WWF wearing too much makeup? Not a wrestler. 
Hogan. Well, no, the re- the wrestlers weren't wearing it, but the announcers were. Um, right, right. Um, God, I'll tell you what, fucking. I remember Michael Cole having some thick shit on it, but but uh, Todd Pettingill used to get makeup <laughs> also. I remember. Um, it was it was. It, they all loved it. You know, Jr. even put up with it. I don't think he loved it, but he put up with it. But I, I would, I would sneak off, and then a- after a while, they'd quit looking for me, and I'd sometimes slip in without anything on. I don't think anybody tuned in the program or tuned out of the program because of what I looked like or where I was wearing, whether I was wearing makeup or not. When did they decide WCW? I don't know if you were still there or not. So if you weren't, just say you weren't. That they needed to have Missy Hyatt take classes to lose her Southern accent. I think that was right after I left because I think that was probably 91 or 92. That was just another, they bought into the thing, well, we don't want to be seen as just a Southern wrestling show, which is what everybody watched it for. And nobody, because it was Southern wrestling, not because people had Southern accents. Nobody gave a shit whether the the announcers or the talent had accents or not. Everybody's got to be from somewhere. But I, I would sit when I was in the WWF and I'd hear all this Southern accent thing, we don't, it, it's Vince's, you know, s- touchy spot because he grew up poor in the trailer park or whatever. But I would sit and listen to shit stain, try to do commentary for the WWF New York show that was just aired on channel nine. And I know that people there knew what he was saying, but he was unintelligible to the rest of the universe. I, my my wife at the time, one time, walked in the room when the, p- the program was playing, and she said, I have not understood one word that he said. What is he fucking saying? It was, un- to anybody outside, whatever, the Bronx or Queens or whatever the fuck, anybody from Montana to California to Texas to Florida, you would not have been able to figure out what the motherfucker was saying, but nobody ever said anything about a New York accent. It was just Southern accents. It's silly. Everybody's from somewhere. If you talk like you look and you can talk, that's all that matters.